It's a great honor to be here. I've spent a lot of time in Oregon. I used to live in the Applegate Valley uh, for about a year. I looked at the blast zones from a nuclear attack from Russia, and when I saw the impact uh, and circles of, uh, uh, that would happen from a nuclear strike, uh, Oregon was one state that stood out to be kind of a nuclear-free uh, uh, zone from impact. So, but anyhow, uh, I, I digress. Um, so, I, I want my first half of my talk will be a little about the history and some and some of uh, some of the research a lot of you are, uh, know about. My second half of, the, of my talk, I think, is too, truly potentially paradigm shifting. So, I do have a conflict of interest. I am an Earthling. <laughs> I have seven books, six of which discover, uh, d describe the cultivation and identification of psilocybin mushrooms. I own a business that many of you know about. I've created a new public benefit corporation here in Oregon called Michael Medical Life Sciences, and I'm an applicant on numerous um, patent applications. But really, the conflict of interest is my life is dedicated to the subject and has been you know, for, for many, many decades. So when we look at the use of psilocybin and magic mushrooms, putatively, in the archaeological record, we have strong hints and suggestions. But so many threads of the ancestral knowledge of psilocybin mushrooms have been cut through disease, wars, domination of cultures that have colonized into indigenous peoples. We all know these stories. The fact that we have any knowledge at all today is a miracle. When you think about it, the majority of psychoactive substances, plants in particular, even animals, um, they're in your horizon of your viewscape uh, for weeks, months, years. You have familiarity factor. But something that's so potent as a psilocybin mushroom that comes up spontaneously and then disappears in four or five days and then recedes from your memory for maybe several years. I mean, think about that. Something that is so potent but so ephemeral, only the cognoscenti in those cultures would be aware of these mushrooms and how to safely identify them. So it's so important that we give Maria Savina and the Mazatecs credit. It's from her generosity and kindness that R. Gordon and Tina Wasson um, were given so much of her grace as well as her knowledge. But it's really important to call out not only Maria Sabina, but Tina Wasson. And I really want to set the record straight here. I've, you know, I've met R. Gordon Wasson. I spent you know, four different occasions with him. I went to three of his lectures. At every single lecture, he gave Tina Wasson credit. She was the mycologist. She was a Russian physician. She was schooled in Latin taxonomy, identification of mushrooms. R. Gordon Wasson was a my, mycophobic, and she was mycophilic. Many of you know that they're honeymoon story of them being in the Adirondacks and coming around a trail and seeing all these mushrooms and Tina was so excited and, and he was aghast. And that, their, that duality of opinions and cultural bias led to the terms mycophilia and mycophobia. But it was Tina, unfortunately, who died in 1958, you know, soon after the publication, or I think maybe soon just before the publication in Life magazine. But she also had another publication a few months before. So it is these great women mycologists who have carried the torch and passed on this knowledge. So there was a number of monographs that came out. One is Les Champagnes and Gen du Mexique uh, that described many of the new, quote unquote, new species that were found in, in Mexico. Maria Sabina used Psilocybe um, zapatocorum. This is really important because the Mazatecs were focused primarily on Psilocybe zapatocorum. And yet, more than 95% of the use of psilocybin mushrooms is, from, is with Psilocybe cubensis. Psilocybe cubensis is likely to have histories of use in Africa and India and really circumpolar throughout the tropics and subtropics. So I think we need to keep this in perspective. There's more than 116 psilocybin active species thus far identified all over the world. So I think that psilocybin mushrooms are a bridge across cultures, and continents. I want to give credit to my father, to my mother, and to my brother John, all of who passed on. My father was, was very much into science. My mother was a very spiritual person. And my brother John was my tripping buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and 
I was the youngest one in my family. I grew up in a fairly large house. We had a complete laboratory in the basement. My father served on the USS Intrepid, an aircraft carrier during World War II. And we got the USS Intrepid's radio in the basement, you know? And so my brother, older brother, would just sit me in the corner. I could listen to coded messages behind the Iron Curtain. And he was a serious scientist. He went on to Yale um, on, on, and majored in chemistry. He then went on to the University of Washington in neurophysiology. But he went to Mexico and Colombia. He came back with these amazing stories of, of finding and using psilocybin mushrooms. I was super eager. And one time, upon his return from Yale, he was on break for about two weeks, and he brought this book, Altered States of Consciousness, by Charles Tart. And, you know, I was fascinated. I was excited. You know, this is you know, very much what John was doing. And so I uh, asked to borrow the book. I borrowed the book. And, um, and John said, okay, you can have the book, but I, you have to give it, give it back to me within, you know, two weeks. So I read the book voraciously, and then my friend Ryan, you know, got real interested in this subject. He asked to borrow the book. So he borrowed the book, and then the time, days passed, and I kept on Ryan, hey, you know, I need to get my brother's book back. I asked him repeatedly over and over, and Ryan kept on avoiding the issue. And then my brother John said, listen, I'm going back. I need that textbook. Please give it back to me. So I pressured Ryan, and Ryan sheepishly looked at me and said, I cannot give you the book back. My father found it and burned it. I said, your father burned my brother's book? I was astonished. Now, his father was a very authoritarian figure. I didn't get along with him anyhow, but he was very uncomfortable and disturbed that perhaps, you know, the view of his son could be polluted <laughs> by the interest in altered states of consciousness. So that really sparked my interest, and I thought, well, if this was so disturbing to this authoritarian figure, then I certainly found an area of interest that I wanted to specialize in. <laughs> So I went on and I published my first book in 1978. 44 years ago, I published my first book. I started writing it, it was 18, 19 years of age. I spent hundreds of hours in the University of Washington Science Library downstairs. Many of you people older know that you go to the libraries and any information on psilocybin mushrooms was razored out. People were so hungry for it. And so I met Dr. Daniel Stuntz at the University of Washington and then he kind of took me under his wing with the mycology department there. So Dr. Daniel Stuntz appears here on the left. Then Kit Skates from Post Falls, Idaho, an incredible uh, woman, mycologist. Dr. Michael Bug, who is still alive, and my mentor, and Alexander Smith. Michael Bug and I received a DEA license in around 1977, which persisted for about 10 years, legally allowing us to grow psilocybin mushrooms in the laboratory and collect them. And then Alexander Smith who wrote a monograph on the genus Psilocybe uh, that was published as well. Now, both my father and Alexander Smith, late in their life, asked me if I would trip with them on psilocybin mushrooms. I turned them both down. Think of that. Two hugely important people in my life finally said, I want to do psilocybin mushrooms with you, Paul. The father of American mycology wrote a monograph on the genus Psilocybe. He wanted to do a trip with me, and I turned him down. I turned him down for two reasons. One, I asked, well, will your wives, will your significant others trip with you? And they both said, no, no way. I went, oh my. What happens if you have a sudden shaking of your spiritual belief system from psilocybin? I don't want to create a chasm in your relationship. And moreover, I adopted the motto, nature provides, I don't. And I take this very, very seriously. You have a moral, ethical responsibility when you give psilocybin mushrooms to someone for their experience. You own part of that experience. That's part of your karma. Think of that. It's so important. These medicines are so powerful. So I think the therapeutic model is extremely important. But at the same token, I believe in the freedom of consciousness. I believe it is a civil right that all of us should have a right to our own consciousness. I believe all of us should be able to le legally possess psychoactive substances. But as soon as you pass them from one person to another, or as soon as you commercialize them, then I think there needs to be controls in place. Some of you may disagree with me, but I have seen you know, corporally the importance of this, of, of this belief. We started doing a series of mushroom conferences. This is in 1979. The first one actually was 1978, Miller Sylvania State Park. We were so paranoid that the DEA was gonna bust us that we actually had 
130 people gather at the Evergreen State College for this conference we advertised. We didn't tell them where it was. We hired buses, and unbeknownst to, their, to them, we took them to a location where they then disembarked on the bus. Now, Jonathan Ott uh, was a leader of this conference. I was also a co-organizer. I kind of got kicked out. But on Friday night, the opening of the conference, they got word the DEA was going to bust the conference. I've never done a public speech before. They didn't show up. I got a message, Paul, start the conference. I'm going, where are the organizers? And they were so afraid the DEA was going to show up. And since the DEA did not bust the first day of the conference, they put Paul out there. <laughs> Um, then they showed up the next day. So I just want to <laughs> let history record this, please. <sighs> it was an extreme area at a time of extraordinary paranoia um, everywhere. So of course I became good friends with Terrence McKenna, and Ter Terrence and um, Dennis McKenna's book um, with Kathleen Harrison and Jeremy Bigwood, the Austin Eric Soul Side and Field Guide, by far was the most significant book of, the, of those times in the 70s. Um, several of my books here. And then these conferences continue, and this conference today is a continuum of these conferences that have started in the, in the mid to late 1970s. So this is a community, this is a continuum. And here is the 1998 in Amsterdam, there's uh, Albert Hofmann there, myself, and many of the uh, other speakers that many of you are familiar with. And then I realized I was in a strange nexus point of, of knowing the Merry Pranksters and a lot of people in the Grateful Dead community, I'm a deadhead. <laughs> and, uh, and Ken Kesey and I and the family became really tight friends. And I realized that I knew the psychedelic researchers and I also know the psychedelic cultural heroes. And so we put together at Brighton Bush Hot Springs, the Millennium Mushroom Conference. 125 people showed up, 40 speakers. So this is the bus further, Ken Kesey, and there of course, Anne and uh, Sasha Shulgin. Um, Andy Weil, myself, Gary Linkoff, and many other notable speakers were there. Okay, so that's, that's some of the sort of, you know, 70s to 80s to 90s, you know, uh, culture perspective. But I just want to draw a, attention to several meta studies that many of you already know about. This is from DSHS, 485,000 people surveyed. Psilocybin use was associated with a 27% reduction in uh, larceny and theft, 22% reduce odds of property, property crime, 18% uh, reduction of violent crime. So interesting also, in a 1,266 community members survey between the ages 16 and 70, there was a direct negative correlation between psilocybin use and partner to partner violence. Statistically significant reduction in violence. Now think of this. Now, people may say association is not causation. It can be, it can be, it can be both. Um, but the narrative from the scientific community increasingly is support that there is a cause and effects relationship. Think of this. Psilocybin reduces crime. When any government officials here, you're thinking about you know, the stress on the economies, you think about law enforcement, the jurisprudence you know, system, all the problems, racism for targeting minorities, all of this. And yet we have a substance that has a strong correlation with people becoming better law-abiding citizens, better people. I believe psilocybin makes nicer people. We have a, there's a, over 102 studies now at clinicaltrials.gov on psilocybin. Now that's extraordinary. They go through IRB boards and some of the parameters are that there's a, there is a need, there's a low risk of, uh, of adverse reactions or toxicity, and that is scalable, and meaning that the medicine is, is able to be, you know, eventually make it through the FDA and potentially uh, to the market. There is now 21 states that have had bills um, or legislation uh, for the decriminalization or legalization of psilocybin. Sadly, not a single state considered microdosing. Now, this is something that, unfortunately, I was on the Oregon Advisory Committee. My recommendations were not accepted. This is a tragedy for the commons. I think that you'll soon see what I mean by that. 
Now, Stephen Ross spoke of this with an alcohol use disorder, but there's also a tremendous association with the reduction of opioid use disorder. This has hit my family personally, something I've had to deal with for the past 10 years. I have a family member in prison right now because of this. So it's not only the victims, yes, the victims and the emanation of the tragedy and being victim of violent crime, you know, affects the family, the individual, the family, the neighbors, the community, the state, the country, the world. What was psilocybin in the pebble of pond of wellness and goodness? Someone benefits from psilocybin, breaking alcohol, opioid addiction. What happens? They tell their friends, they tell their families. They're a bearer of good news. So the pebble in the pond of, of wellness and, and goodness also emanates, but even further out. So the reduction of crime is one element, but the improved mental health of society in general, I think, is an extraordinary benefit. So, uh, Michelle and Jesse, thank you for your excellent presentation. Yes, Psilocybe cubensis is the species that's most commonly in use. We launched a microdose study at microdose.me. Uh, we have over 20,000 people. You can download it for the Droid and Apple devices. And we have launched version two. We have just launched it in the past two weeks. We have over 1,000 people subscribing. I encourage you to join microdose.me if you're interested and tell your friends about it. This has all been vetted through ethics review boards to make sure this is anonymized, the, the patient, uh, the reporting data is, is private. But this meta-analysis that we created was really stimulated by these other meta-studies, like, wow, this associations, but what are people actually doing microdosing? Now, let me define microdosing as being a non-intoxicating dose. Unfortunately, there's four or five articles that have come out in the peer-reviewed literature talking about microdosing, but they're minor dosing. My, my, microdosing means you do not feel an effect. There's no intoxicating effect. 0.5 grams you know, of Psilocybe cubensis um, is a sensorium effect. I think most of the people who have done that, they know you can actually feel it. So with microdosing in, in this definition that I'm proposing as being non-intoxicating, you know, colors are brighter, you're in a happier mood, problems don't see as significant, you're more creative and productive, but it's not intoxicating. So this is where it's unfortunately that microdosing has not been adopted by Oregon, and many of these other states are not considering it, they can't wrap their mind around it. Because if you want to microdose in Oregon, I'm not sure how many hours it is now, four to six hours going to a therapeutic clinic, sitting in a chair, bored out of your gourd. You know, what the WTF, what, why would I want to do this? You know? So it's totally missed, again, a potential tragedy for the commons. So we have this app here. It has many challenge tests, one for memory. You put in your password. You're asked, what are you microdosing? How much are you microdosing with? What are you microdosing with? And has then challenge tests as well. It has memory tests and you light the flowers light up. Can you then recall the sequence of the fire of the flowers uh, lighting up? And, and vision, uh, auditory tests, and things like this. And so we published our study with over 14,000 uh, patients, or not patients, um, you know, self-reporting microdosers. Um, this is published in Nature Scientific Reports. The peer reviewers were so amazed at the, at the, the data set was so large. And so this is a qualitative study. Why you're microdosing, what your income is, what your, your racial background is, you know, uh, you know, why you're microdosing, what's your primary reason for microdosing. And so in there also, we had what are you microdosing and combining it with? Now, I have been popularizing something called the stack, which is a combination of psilocybin mushrooms, uh, niacin, and lion's mane. Now, psilocybin mushrooms contain much more than psilocybin. There's psilocybin, psilocin, baocystin, norbaocystin, norcilocin, aruginicin. These are all tryptamine analogs that co-occur. And yet, all the studies, with the exception of one or two, that have been published in, on, in clinical trials are using psilocybin, the molecule, 
which is totally divorced from real world use, where the majority of people in the public are not using psilocybin the molecule, they're using psilocybin mushrooms. So we propose, in working with Roland Griffiths, to do a parallel study of psilocybin mushrooms versus psilocybin the pure molecule. We're still working on that. So the Stamets stack became very popularized, and I chose niacin because I realized when you take niacin, you start to flush and you itch. So it excites your, per your peripheral nervous system, your, and it excites your nerves. And then I realized that neuropathies oftentimes present themselves as a deadening of the fingertips and the toes. And psilocybin is a vasoconstrictor. Niacin is a vasodilator. And then lion's mane, there's four clinical tri trials uh, that have been published. We pub I popular a website for researchers and physicians at mushroomreferences.com. You can look all this up. And uh, lion's mane has been shown to contain aranacines. These are compounds that stimulate the remyelination uh, on the axons of nerves. And demyelination, amyloid plaques, et cetera, of course, have been implicated with Alzheimer's. So, that was studied, that, and then this article came out, also on, on alcohol use disorder. Uh, I think most of you all are familiar with that, and Stephen actually talked about it as well. So the majority of people are using a microdose, which is a low dose, and it's less than uh, 0.1 uh, grams, uh, which tend, is what you call one milligram uh, of, of psilocybin. Uh, one gram of psilocybin is equivalent to 10 milligrams at 1%. So one-tenth of a gram of psilocybin cubensis is one milligram. And the majority of people are in this low to medium dose. 88% um, of the respondents are in the, and truly in a microdose realm. So we did a follow-up report that was published in Scientific Reports uh, in a Nature publication June 30th of this year. Now, our preliminary data, you know, in our, uh, which has not been published, showed a strong uh, decrease in anxiety and depression using the stack. We also saw it with psilocybin. Uh, the degree of significance was greater with the stack, um, but it gets into that fuzzy realm that it's so significantly reduced. And then the critics came out. Well, this is not a placebo-controlled study. Well, no shit, Sherlock. It's an observational study. <laughs> People are not going to be motivated to microdose and then take a placebo, right? They're microdosing because they're taking the psilocybin. So it pff, kind of blows our mind why these, why some of these critics, they really didn't think through this very well. But a valid criticism that we accepted was expectancy. It's not placebo, it's expectancy. You ex you're hoping that you have a benefit from microdosing, so you expect, because of the popularity of it, that you'd have a reduction in these symptoms. Indeed, we saw that. But in my dialogue with Dr. Pram Crisco, we helped co-design the microdose study. I was very sensitive to this concept of placebo or expectancy, and we both decided we, we need to get in a psychomotor test that's beyond expectancy. You know, not something that's subjective, but something you can actually physically demonstrate. You know, does psilocybin uh, microdosing benefit people? And we've zeroed in on the finger tapping test. It is used for Alzheimer's patients, Parkinson's patients, progressive dementia, traumatic brain injury. I have a friend whose husband fell off of a, a roof, hit his head, and she goes, yeah, they do the tap test. How many times you can tap your fingers in 10 seconds? When you're 22, you can do a lot faster than when you're 82. Because the sad fact of life is neurodegeneration is age-related and progressive over time. So the tapping test is a challenge test, and we ask at the, at the baseline. And you know, admittedly, people get practiced initially for the first three times they do it, but they can like, hit a hit threshold of maximum. So the, the tapping test um, has been used in well over 100 publications in the scientific literature, specific, specifically related to neurodegeneration using this test. It's very convenient. It's arithmetically translatable. And when we got the results back, actually, I didn't get the results back. The statisticians on our team, uh, Zach Walsh and Joey Rootman being one of them, they actually, I got the message that we have some data back. We're kind of shocked by it. We don't want to share it with you until we acid test it. And so they did. They hit it with three different analytical systems of analysis, statistically, and the results came to be true. 
So I had no insight to this data whatsoever until the data was revealed. We published this in Nature June 30th of this year, and these are the results. Psilocybin in any form had no significant increase in the frequency and the cadence of tapping in 30 days with microdosing. But the combination of psilocybin and microdosing with niacin and lion's mane had an enormous effect. The p-value of significance is 0.004. That means there's one chance in 250. Actually, the p-value is 0 0.001, but then they threw out some outliers and reduced it to 0.004. One chance in 250. That this is just noise. That this is not you know, a cause and effect relationship. So we saw that, wow, we have a psychomotor benefit. There's outside of subjectivity, expectancy. There's no possible, I mean, talking to other statisticians, you know, they twist themselves in pretzels trying to figure out how is it possible to have an expectancy benefit in 55 plus year olds, you know, with expectancy with a tap test. So we thought, okay, we have something here. Now, the previous speaker talked about mechanism and modes of action. That's something we're really, really interested in. So we started looking at neuroreceptors. And we studied the literature. I have uh, 10 full-time research scientists, five PhDs, who have also published on psilocybin in the scientific literature. And so I tasked them, OK, let's go ahead and let's dig into neuroreceptors. And so we went into a whole bunch of neuroreceptors. But the ones we really want to focus on are MAP kinases. These are track A, track B, and track C. And these code for neurogeneration. Basically, these are receptor proteins, which when there's binding affinity to it, stimulate nerve growth factors, or brain-derived neurotropic factors, uh, or other uh, ways of stimulating uh, neuronal outgrowth, forking, and also helping atrophying nerves being able to relive, become alive again, to, to regrow. We also looked at some other receptors that are related to neuroanti-inflammatories, JAK1s. So when we combined psilocin and niacin, we found synergy. Now, synergy is beyond the cumulative additive effects. The individual components have some signal. The other component has another signal. The cumulative additive effect you see there is in red and blue. But the synergistic effect, in this case, of psilocin and niacin on track A is 4.8 and 6.4. 6 so that's surprising. That's interesting. Unexpected. So we then looked at lion's mane. Well, let's add lion's mane psilocin and, and, uh, and, and niacin together. And we found something that was a new term of art for me. It's called maximum calculable value. It's when each of these components have no activity whatsoever, but the three of them strung together have massive synergy. And notice it is at the microdosing level. So this is down to 1 25th of, of a tenth of a gram. So we started look, looking at other things. We said, let's look at the psilocybin analogs that co-occur. Let's look at norcilocin and niacin on track A's. Again, maximum calculable value. No effect on, with psilocin at these concentrations, again, at the microdosing levels. So then we looked at norbeocystin and niacin. All of these tryptamines are co-occurring in Psilocybe cubensis that have been consumed. Again, we have a massive synergistic effect. Most exciting to me, digging into the literature, is psilocin and niacin on track Bs. These code for stem cells uh, that truly lead to neurogenesis that differentiate in the hippocampus. And again, we have maximum calculable value. And then we look then, well, look at aranacines in psilocin on track C. And we also have massive synergy. So, so keep this in mind. These are multiple synergistic reactions that are occurring simultaneously that leads to neuroplasticity. Newborn neurons, new connections. So this is all at the microdosing level. A very popular, hard to call it popular, but increasingly prevailing belief with many physicians in Canada is a macrodose followed by microdosing. Much in the same way that Roland Griffiths at Johns Hopkins also showed that 14 months after a high dose of psilocybin, the very act of re-remembering the experience was therapeutically beneficial. 
Now, when you re-remember, you are re-remembering using the neuro new neurological pathways that were resident and coded that are resident within your memory. So the idea with microdosing as subsequent to macrodosing is you have a he heavy, intense therapeutic dose of sure with therapists, it's you know with good set and settings, et cetera. But then on microdosing, then you can revisit and refortify those neurological pathways. So we think we have found the mechanisms of action. Moreover, we've grown out neurons, brain neurons in vitro, and we see these similar results. We have several hundred now examples of synergism, several hundred. We have more than 50 examples of maximum calculable value with psilocybin and the tryptamines combined with niacin and or lion's mane. There are 11 studies at clinicaltrials.gov, Stephen Ross alluded to some of them, that use niacin as the active placebo, teaching 180 degrees from my idea, opposite. And I bring up to many of these clinicians who are co-authors and co-investigators who are looking at the peer-reviewed literature or involved in designing these studies. Is it ethical for you to give them an active placebo called niacin? Who's someone who's severely depressed with treatment-resistant depression or other PTSD, when in 20 minutes they flush red, they itch, and they realize they've been tricked and they got the placebo, aren't you exacerbating their depression? Not a single clinical study has addressed this question. What is the role of the physicians and what is the ethics of giving an active placebo to depressed or mentally ill people or challenged people when you are the cause of causing their depression to be greater because they feel that they didn't get psilocybin, they didn't get the medicine. No one's addressed this. I think niacin is a catalyst, as a vasodilator. It amplifies the effects of psilocybin at microdosing levels. Moreover, and I'm only showing you just a few slides, I have so much of this, we're very interested in neuro-anti-inflammatories. Because when you have cell growth, oftentimes it's associated most of the time with inflammation. This is what happens, they co-occur. So to have neuronal outgrowth or stimulation of newborn neurons coupled with neuro-anti-inflammatory effects is really interesting to us. And moreover, JAK1 is also code for antiviral molecules. So an area, obviously, that we're looking into is, is COVID and brain fog, long haulers, and Stay tuned. This is just the tip of the proverbial iceberg. I've spent literally hundreds and hundreds of hours on this subject. Many of you know I've, we've been in stealth mode. I've been quiet. I let all these companies and the other people fight it out on Twitter. Friggin' embarrassing, children. <laughs> Why don't you just call up the authors and have an intelligent adult conversation? But instead, you throw spears at each other, and then people get emotional. <laughs> so what are delivery systems? Well, chocolate works great. The Aztecs taught us that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I present to you that this stack, and I'm as surprised you know, as anyone, can help rejuvenate the nervous system as we progress with age-related neurodegeneration, with disease-induced neurodegeneration, viruses, with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, exposure to pesticides, other toxins. But think of this. The Homo sapiens are only 200,000 years old. We're a new species. I think it's time for us to evolve into a new species. Psilocybin and psilocybin used for the commons, and microdosing, which is affordable and usable to everyone, which does not need you to be sitting in a clinic, could have an enormous impact for stimulating us to evolve into a new species. I'm proposing that new species, we go from Homo sapiens to Homo ascendus. It's time for us to ascend to being a new species. All of us, I believe, are inherently good. All of us here are striving to make society better. There has never been a time more critical in the evolution of human species fighting 
the challenges of climate change. When people are happier, they're more creative. When they're more creative, they're happier. When they're happier, they're more open, hearted, joining hands with their community, excited about the next day. And every day that I wake up, I'm excited to greet the morning. Because in the ether of being asleep, I'm cogitating and thinking about these and the impact. This could be the major stimulus for improving not only mental health, but to creating Einsteins that towards the end of their lives, they're coherent, they're intelligent, they're able to pass the torch of knowledge to the next generation. This is truly a time for a paradigm shift. I thank you for your attention. do about a 15-minute Q&A with Paul, um, and you'll have to be patient with me because there are a lot of questions on this app, so I'm going to try to scroll through and, and pick the best ones, but it's a little more chaotic than the previous. But to start, actually, Paul, I'd like to ask a question. Um, this topic of microdosing has been, as you know, a hot topic in the scientific community these days. It was a hot topic on the Oregon Psilocybin Advisory Board, a lot of debate back and forth about the therapeutic potential, a lot of recent articles that have been published on microdosing. Um, and I love your app design and all of the rich data and information that's going into that. Um, my question is if you have any thoughts on some of the recent placebo-controlled trials um, that have looked at microdosing in comparison with placebo and have found basically no difference between the groups? Yeah, um, it's extraordinary that the people designing these microdosing studies are not studying microdosing. They're calling it microdosing. The one out of Brazil, I think, was 0.5 grams of Slossopy Cavensis. And the ones that also been published by Imperial College and other groups, they have two microdosing sessions, two weeks apart. Not the James Fadiman uh, protocol and mine, that we're suggesting putatively um, are three to five, uh, th five times a week, four to five times per week. And not a single one of these studies are addressing, again, real-time use. You saw the surveys. This is what the majority of people are doing. And let me bring out one other point. The p-value of significance, a point zero zero four for the TAP test, think about all the confounders, especially you biostatisticians out there. Variability in the potency of the mushrooms, Variability in the amount of niacin you're taking. Variability in, in lion's mane. Those three confounders would dilute significance. So in fact, significance may be understated if we standardize them. But this is what's shocking to me, and this is why I'm an outlier. I'm self-employed, I can't be fired. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, and bless their hearts, these professors at universities, you know, have to be very careful. They have very tight guardrails, and they're afraid, literally, academically afraid. So they tend to be ultra-conservative. But the fact they're disconnected from the microdosing community, and they publish articles on microdosing that are not related to microdosing as it's being practiced, again, it's just mind-boggling. So we're looking forward to publishing some clinical studies, and we have one on Parkinson's designed for 2023. Uh, with, with, so we can narrow this down and refine it. Amazing. Yeah, one last thing that I'm curious about more, I guess as a comment, but feel free to respond as well, is just about the, the finger tapping findings, which are astounding that there's that big of a significant difference there. Uh, I'm curious how that might correlate to um, That's a great mood, question. mood and other sorts of um, well-being and those kinds of outcome measures yeah. um, in combination with Yeah, we know that calcium is really important for the metabolism and, and production of psilocybin. A tremendous variability between the mushrooms, you know, from 0.1% to 2% in variability, strains and phenotypes. You know, it's a, it's a multifactorial equation. I see this as part of health as well. The, you know, the potency of the mushrooms, the potential therapeutic benefit, uh, the outcome is a series of, of coefficient multipliers when multiplied together with all those other, you know, the microbiome and individual sensitivities, all that, the outcome of which is, is benefit or not. So this is something that needs to be disambiguated. Mm -hmm. um, this is why I propose, and Washington State's considering this very carefully, 
let's have a new metric for microdosing. Let's have one label not to exceed. What's the worst will happen? You won't get as much. You're not going to overdose. So if you stack it with Ipecac, capsicum, niacin, 30 or 40 other adverses, people will take microdosing, and the standardization is not to exceed because psilocybin mushrooms degrade in time. There's a lot of efforts on stabilization, but if you have a not to exceed limit, then let the free market economy then gravitate to the producers and suppliers that are producing the best standardized products. So this is a new concept to a lot of physicians, but it makes a lot of sense to me. You're not going to overdose with a not to exceed, you know, on a microdosing label. Yeah. But again, I'm, I call out the Oregon. You know, I hope the Oregon officials here and people involved in this will revisit microdosing because, frankly, it's economically impossible for low-income people to engage in a therapeutic session costing thousands of dollars. Thank you. And I think what I'm hearing underneath all of this as a common thread is that, you know, effect aside, there's not harm that's being done. So why yeah. not try it? Right. Because we might as well try yeah. something that could have an effect as opposed to restricting. Yeah, but then the no doctors, harm. patients, communities, other people can say, well, this, this, this group of companies has really got their act together. This other group of companies, they're using two-year-old cubensis they grew a whole bunch on, they're sitting on it, and now it's degraded substantially over time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go to some of the questions here. Let's see. Um, more about microdosing. Um, regarding long-term microdosing and the concerns raised by FinFin, I'm yeah. curious if there has been recent light shed on the potential for heart valve damage. Well, okay, that's a, I, I did the math on this. I think it's one out of two thousandths of potential impact. Half-life of psilocybin is two and a half hours. FenFen, I think, is over 24 hours. Two and a half hours, two hours, one five hundredth the amount of psilocybin in your system compared to FenFen. Then you look at the amount for microdosing, because the studies that have been put out where people are suggesting they're, again, that minor dosing or macro dosing. People aren't macro dosing every day or minor dosing every day. They're micro dosing. So you string out all these, and you look at each component where this exaggeration of, of harm potential, you have to really, again, I'm suspect, has the academics, are they just up there on the stage and their podium, hey, myself, I'm subject to the same criticism, they're pushing a point of view without giving you the accurate information. Because when you look at the half-life, the concentrations, and then you look at just because it does bind to the 5-HT2B uh, receptor, what does it do on the other side of that cell? Mm -hmm. And there's some great examples of that already in the scientific literature. Just because you have binding affinities doesn't mean it's going to re uh, result in heart valve uh, uh, arrhythmia and damage. So again, I would just, any of you out there, please look at FenFen, -fen, look at the concentrations, look at the binding affinities, look at the binding affinities with, with psilocin, look at the concentrations, and do the math. It is extraordinarily over-exaggerated, in my opinion. Okay? Thank you. A couple more questions, but one thing I forgot to mention before we started the Q&A, just to remind everyone that Paul will be signing copies of his book after this uh, Q&A is over, and that there are copies available for sale and out in the lobby. So, okay, a couple more questions. Sure. Uh, what is the impact of the stack when taking clinical or heroic doses? Somebody wants to know. I don't know. <laughs> Any thoughts? Uh, I think it should be explored, but I don't know. Good question. <laughs> Do you have any specific suggestions for how we might move the ball forward for legalizing microdosing in Oregon? I know that's a really big question, but curious to hear your well, thoughts. Well, I'm not familiar enough, and what I recommended to Washington State is that make sure we have an exit ramp for novel research, innovations for medical doctors who may come up with a new idea that does not restrict them from developing this idea to have to pass a new measure. And unfortunately, from my reading of Oregon, you do not have that without having another ballot initiative. And um, so I think, unfortunately, unfortunately, my voice was not listened to. You know, I thought I had really good arguments for this. And for whatever reason, I was put on the back burner. Okay. 
Uh, maybe I'm too forceful in my opinion. I don't know. <laughs> there were a lot of opinions being uh, shared, I think, in that whole process. And yep. some were heard and some were not. And it might be a mystery as to how that that's came the way to be. It, that's the way it is. <laughs> uh, let's see. There's a question here about niacin. Um, if non-flushing niacin is used, is the benefit of niacin lost in the stack? Good question. We're exploring that. Uh, we do have information on that, which right now I'm not ready to reveal, but a uh, non-flushing form of niacin is not a vasodilator. So the idea of vasodilation, you get more of the neurogenitive benefits of the psilocybin and psilocybin tryptamines that are going specifically to the endpoints of the peripheral nervous system for benefit. So the flushing form of niacin not, uh, has the benefits of vasodilation and that tingling you feel is the excitement of, your, of the endpoints of your peripheral nervous system. So I feel that the flushing form of niacin adds more benefits and then it becomes an adversive. It becomes if you try to take 10 times or 20 times as much, and any of you have done 500 milligrams of niacin, <laughs> you know, and you had a microdosing at 50 milligrams, we just begin the flush for most people, the adverse event of taking a high dose of niacin would be a great deterrent, like antabuse is to alcoholics. So there's about four or five reasons. Also, uh, nicotinic acid is a strong anti-inflammatory, which is uh, interesting as well. And it's been implicated in, um, in high doses for helping people with depression. So there's about six different reasons why nicotinic acid, niacin, um, is better th than nicotinamides. Okay. It's definitely fascinating, yeah. the piece about niacin as a catalyst. I'm curious yeah. to see your results when you yeah. come up with those. Well, we have uh, four papers that are, that are in various stages of publications. We call them white papers that I've done internally. And so we will be submitting two to three papers per year now, now that I have 10 full-time research scientists on board. And um, it's really exciting time for Awesome. Us. That is exciting. Ten yeah. full-time research scientists. Yeah, 10 <laughs> full-time research scientists. That's Amazing. all they do. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, a couple more. Someone is wondering, could you compare the benefits of a protocol with macrodose followed by microdose I think versus I, I, the other way around? I, is macrodose, for, well, you could do it both ways, I'm sure. But so I, I think, think that the, the concept of re-remembering and the, the concept of revisiting and mm. stimulating those same neurological pathways that was resident in your memory. And you know, we all have muscle memory, body memory. You know, think about riding a bicycle, something like that. You can not be on a bike for 20 years. You get on a bike and you can, you can, you can pick up the neurological pathways as well. So that, I think go, the, the, the two go together. Mm -hmm. And I, I think many, many physicians that I know of, especially in Canada, uh, really believe that this combination may maximize benefit. And you can still be under medical consultation, you know, for microdosing subsequent to a macrodose, but you don't necessarily have to go and be inside of a clinic, you know? Mm. In a, and, and talk about set and setting. We know that blood pressure of patients go up when they go into a physician's office to get their blood pressure tested. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about your anxiety <laughs> going into a clinic with a bunch of doctors in white coats in a hospital setting, you're gonna get this massive dose surrounded by equipment and all these people peering at you. Yeah. Right? Especially if you've never had an experience like yeah. that before. That so, be I mean, the idea of, I think that the nature setting is where I think a lot of us, you know, I'm an Oregonian at heart. <laughs> I've picked a lot, I've tripped a lot on the Oregon coastline. <laughs> I really I like the sea. <laughs> I, I like the waves. I like the coastline. So, anyhow. So. Um, let's see. I guess we have time for maybe one more. Do you think there's a place for organized religious and spiritual practice with mushrooms outside of the medical research and regulatory frameworks? I have a feeling I know the answer to this, but... No, to I, absolutely. My own personal belief is I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. I believe there's the convergence of science and spirituality. And this is the other thing I'll mention. We're all on a spectrum, aren't we? I have a little psychiatrist in my brain when I'm tripping telling me to be a better person, you can do it. I don't have to see a therapist or a psychiatrist. The majority of us are self-reflecting, trying to improve ourselves, and we don't necessarily need an outside therapist or guide. That, that speaks to the universality of the commons. Most all of us can benefit from microdosing and psilocybin 
internal use, and I would, yes, I would say that I'm not religious, I'm spiritual, but if you want to call it religious, break that, break that umbrella large enough so it's not identified with any one religion, mm -hmm. but it's identified with spiritual practices of your choice. I think that's the big difference. Amazing. Okay. And I feel like that concept of, of remembering goes along right. with that framework yeah. as well. And community. And community. And, and one other thing. Is, Great. But I think most people here, when you meet a stranger who's been psychedelicized, who's been a tripster, who's gone into it, you can look in their eyes and you immediately know that you've got a brother and a sister. You know? We got a whole room full of <laughs> brothers and sisters here. Okay, all right. Thank you, Paul. All right. Thank you really, much. Really, all right. Always a pleasure. Okay, thank you all. Thank you.